Welcome to the book launch of Culture and the Literary, Matter Metaphor Memory, authored by Dr. Abhishek Parvi and published by Roman and Littlefield, hosted by the Center for Memory Studies, IIT Madras. We are related to re have received such a tremendous response to this event, and we have attendees joining from countries including Russia, Croatia, Germany, UK, US, Poland, and Australia. Thank you all for joining us on this special occasion from different time zones. The book, Culture and the Literary, Matter, Metaphor, Memory, authored by Dr. Avishek Parvi, is an interdisciplinary study of the phenomenon of culture, drawing from the theoretical frameworks of memory studies, material engagement theory, and affect studies, Dr. Parvi examines in this work the complex intertwining of matter, metaphor, and memory, and offers inventive insights into how culture is represented, case studies, or fictional and non-fictional representations. The endorsements for the book by the exponents in the field of memory studies, including Astrid Earl, Fritz Breithaupt, and Steph Raps, bear testament to the work's valuable addition to this rich field of study. The book, Culture and the Literary, is an upshot of the kind of research undertaken by the Center for Memory Studies and exemplifies its thrust areas by exploring the connection between technology, culture, and the everydayness and materiality of memory. The Center for Memory Studies is delighted to organize its second book launch, which marks yet another milestone in our journey. The past one year has been a remarkable sojourn for us, and we have been able to contribute to the intensive academic engagements and also to establish a global research network. Founded with the vision to become a leading center of memory studies through a multidisciplinary approach combining the humanities, social sciences, cognitive sciences, and digital technology, the center has facilitated research avenues to scholars and academics through multiple workshops and research symposiums. We are glad that our work has been receiving much traction nationally and globally, which give us the impetus to broaden the scope of our work. Moreover, the center also fosters international collaborations, our association with the Coast Action Slow Memory Project, chaired by Professor Jenny Wustenberg, the MOU signed with the University of St. Andrews, which has also received the British Council's Going Global Partnership Grant, are some of the highlights of our international collaborations. The center has also set up an Exa lab with the aim of integrating digital technology to produce tangible research output using AR, VR, and Exa tools. We hope to broaden the scope and verticals of the memory research in the years to come. The center is grateful to the director for taking time out of his busy schedule, accepting our invite to officially release the book. It's an excellent uh, initiative. The book, it says, uh, I, I just had a glance of this book. Let me just uh, share some very interesting things. Kasparov, world-renowned uh, chess champion, had written a book called Deep Thinking, which actually draws the boundary between artificial intelligence and natural intelligence. Uh, and one of the interesting examples that he gave was that he played uh, a rapid round. Rapid round is you are given a very short time and you have to uh, you have to finish every move within some specific amount of time. With 100 computers in a room and he was walking from one computer to the next computer and he completed the game. Uh, and he was playing against 100 computers, so 100 games at the same time. And he was walking from one to another. And uh, this was actually one part of the story. Wherein there is a computer which is playing against the cash flow, but 100 computers playing against cash flow. On the other hand, he said, let us try the wafers up. Let us put 100 cash flows and one robo moving and playing this game. Right? The problem actually is, uh, becomes extremely complex. Right? Because when you look at chess as a game, it's a rule-based game. There is a representation of the game in the memory, right, of the computer. And that is very clear. You have a screen and every coin is represented in the uh, board. And so the computer can easily find out what is the current state of that chess board, right? Which coin is in which place. And then it can calculate the moves. And even when Caspro actually makes the move on the screen, can easily find out which coin has moved from where to where. This is very easy. But if if you do the vice versa of having 100 Kasparos sitting uh, and one robo moving, the robo has to go to a particular place. It has to take an image of the chess. And then from that, it has to calculate where the coins are and then uh, calculate the move and then actually pick using the arm the correct move and move it to the other place without toppling anything else. And then it has to move 
to the next place and actually find out where the next place is. Even identification of where the next chessboard is, is a very complex uh, uh, imaging problem. So that is where the line between artificial intelligence and natural intelligence come. And many such examples have been called a very interesting books called Deep Thinking. I find that uh, this particular uh, book, which uh, uh, is coming out here, uh, will in some sense uh, be a sort of a precursor to understanding more of uh, the interface between machine and human. I, that's, that's, that's the feel I got from this, uh, though there are a lot of uh, metaphors and uh, other things being dealt here. Uh, and this is going to be a very interesting way ahead for AI-based people to basically start looking into what is there here. The, and a lot of things are being covered here, all the way from medicine. We have some sections on culture, technology, history, memory, and forgetting. These are all some very interesting things that are coming out of this book. I see it from a computer science point of view. I'm sure uh, this will open up a very new special understanding of AI from a human perspective. Uh, the other interesting thing is uh, very important today is responsible AI, where we are talking of autonomous vehicles, right? So one of the questions that comes is, can what would be the insurance policy, accident insurance policy for an autonomous vehicle? So if an autonomous vehicle actually goes and hits a person, then uh, whom, whom are we to blame, right? So so this opens up a big topic called Responsible AI. And that a uh, lot, lot more of thought has to go. Uh, many problems are still unsolved in that area. And this type of a very objective understanding of uh, the entire concept of human uh, development, the human culture and other things uh, will play a major role. Uh, and especially this leading to ethics. And I see a, a, a very... Uh, uh, different uh, technical angle uh, to this uh, particular work. Uh, and I wish that uh, we continue more on this uh, at IIT Madras and let us see some nice things coming out of this, uh, this type of work. Uh, I congratulate uh, Avishek, uh, uh, who is the principal investigator for the Center for Memory Studies. And... Uh, I uh, congratulate him for this and I hope that many such work comes and I want to see a very good uh, bridge between technology uh, and these type of studies, uh, which are very important. With this, I'm very happy to release this book. And thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, let me begin formally. Respected Director, Professor um, uh, Kamakoti. Uh, distinguished uh, speakers and guests, Prof. Professor Catherine O'Leary and Professor Hannah Tysler, my energetic colleagues, uh, Dr. Abhishek and uh, Dr. Merin, uh, other colleagues from the department present here, academics from different parts of the globe, scholars and students. I welcome you to this launch of the book, Culture and Literary, Matter, Metaphor and Memory by my department colleague, uh, Dr. Abhishek, uh, published by Roman and Littlefield. Uh, needless to say, the book deals with that space of meaning making where culture and literary constitute and also confront each other and on occasions become indistinguishable as well. They can in fact also relativize and undermine each other, but in the very act of that undermining, they also converse and offer possibilities. And the book is one such possibility. Dr. Abhishek has advanced the cause of literary cultural studies, no doubt. But uh, more importantly, he has reopened the debate that has been bugging thinkers for centuries. Uh, borrowing from his experience uh, in diverse fields, actually, say, colonial discourse, post-colonial theory, consumer culture, medical humanities, critical class and race studies, Dr. Abhishek demonstrates his ease of uh, traversing through uh, different registers of human experience. Uh, honestly, I have not read the book uh, beyond the brief description that I got on Amazon. Actually, I took some time to uh, see uh, the description. But knowing Abhishek, his workaholic nature, uh, his total devotion to research and teaching uh, are something which I definitely believe uh, worth emulating. 
I, I, I wish I had a magic wand to multiply Abhishek and fill the department with many Abhisheks and, and his way of doing things. I hope the book will find wide readership and will be liked by both students and academics and enthuse them to delve into questions that Dr. Abhishek has actually sought to address. These are, these are very foundational questions. And, and the most basic things of human life are the most profound. That is what I understand. In many uh, Indo-Aryan languages, including Odia, the language that I speak, book launch is called Lokarpana Utsava. So it's Loka Arpana Utsava. So, so it is a cause of celebration. It's a Utsava. Not just uh, because Abhishek has authored it, but also because the book is being offered to the people, the lok or the folk. So arpan could mean offering, surrender, sacrifice. And I believe in this act of launching the book, this is going to be people's book. It is my privilege to be associated with this event. Congratulations to Abhishek and thank you all. Um, I'm delighted to be here today to participate in the launch of Dr. Abhishek Parui's book, Culture and the Literary Matter, Metaphor, Memory, which is published by Roman and Littlefield. My name is Catherine O'Leary and I'm a professor of Spanish literature, but also the director of Cultural Identity and Memory Studies Institute at the University of St Andrews in Scotland. My knowledge of Avishek and his work comes from our growing collaboration in the field of memory studies. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about this collaboration. A couple of years ago, back in the pre-pandemic era, I received an email from an academic in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. That academic was Abhishek. He was aware of the work we were doing in our institute and alerted me to the great work that was taking place in the recently established Center for Memory Studies at IIT Madras, led by him and Dr. Meren Simiraj. He asked if we might collaborate in areas of mutual interest, and more specifically, if we would be interested in using such a collaboration for, uh, to set up a memorandum of understanding between our two institutions. I spoke to my colleague, Dr. Anindya Rai Chaudhuri, a memory studies scholar based in the School of English at St. Andrews, and a member of the Institute. And together we brought this proposal to the global office of the University of St. Andrews. The Memorandum of Understanding that was signed in early 2021 offers opportunities for academic and research collaboration, for exchange of students and faculty, and sponsorship of cooperative seminars, workshops, and other academic meetings. Yet this was only the first step in our collaboration. At the level of research, the collaboration between the Centre for Memory Studies at IIT Madras and the Cultural Identity and Memory Studies Institute at the University of St Andrews is thriving. And we've been able to share our perspectives on memory studies on several occasions. Avishek and Meren presented a joint talk at our institute on encoding, effacing and the phenomenon of forgetting in November 2020. And a year later, they gave another insightful presentation on fabulation and forgetting in literature and memory studies. And we, from our end, um, as mentioned, myself and Anindya both participated in Food Memory Machines, the workshop organized by the Center for Memory Studies at IIT Madras. Our two research centers are now collaborating on a postgraduate symposium on memory crisis and estrangement, which will take place on the 22nd of April this year. Our collaboration is also moving into the realm of teaching, and we're currently exploring joint masters level online provision. And as mentioned, we were successful in our joint application to the British Council for a going global exploratory grant to work on this. So far, we've run a series of workshops and talks related to our funded transnational education project called Memory Studies in its national and international contexts. Our work will enable formal alignment of diverse approaches to memory studies 
taught in two institutions located in different geopolitical settings and will explore industry academia links established by IIT Madras. But I would like to move away from our collaboration now to say something about Avishek the scholar. His work with Meron to establish and foster the discipline of memory studies in India is difficult to overstate. Beyond that, he's been involved in many interdisciplinary projects, several of them relating to the interface between humanities and technology. He serves on the boards of scholarly societies and publishing houses, and he's published many works on, amongst other things, memory, modernism and postmodernism, and masculinity but he's also someone who engages with a broader public, sharing his knowledge and expertise with those beyond the academy, demonstrating with his journalistic work and his ability to link the erudite and the popular, the value of the humanities to understanding society. And it is this idea, as Avishek puts it, the necessity to read literary texts for a fuller and more complex understanding of culture and cultural valences that we are here to celebrate today with the publication of Culture and the Literary, Matter, Metaphor, Memory. It will come as no surprise to those of you who know Avishek to see that this book intertwines several strands of scholarship in the application of a variety of theoretical frames, memory studies, thing, theory, race studies, affect studies, to both literary and non-fictional texts. It is an ambitious work and it delivers challenging the reader to look anew at key ideas in cultural studies, to consider the links between political power and the power of narratives, and to explore, and I quote, the relationship between things, events, and their affective associations in lived experience, as well as in fictional frames. As we might expect from a memory studies scholar, even when considering the representation of the historical, the link to current concerns is ever present. Reading the book, I was struck by the challenge to academics to think about the role and responsibilities of cultural studies as a discipline. What we do with it when considering such important societal issues as colonialism. From the accessible, and that accessibility is important, perspective of literature, Avishek argues that we can consider hugely significant social, political, and human issues. Cultural identities and normative narratives of race are unpicked, discourses of control and alienation are explored, and literature's transgressive potential is highlighted. In terms of breadth of scholarship and the bringing together of ideas, the book is a tour de force. In a powerful way, this book explores matter, memory, and history, and reclaims literature as, and I quote, a production of possibilities as an articulation of ambivalence, whereby commonly consumed cultural codes may be alternately and sometimes simultaneously consolidated and questioned. The essence of the book reminds me of Richard Carney's idea of narrative as an open-ended invitation to ethical and poetical responsiveness. To end, I would like to thank Avishek for his dynamism, his openness to collaboration and for his scholarship. He has established himself as a scholar of note in the interdisciplinary field of memory studies and has done this with great generosity, involving other colleagues and students in stimulating conversations and offering them opportunities for academic exchange. Avishek, hearty congratulations on the publication of your book, and I look forward to continued collaboration and friendship. Thank you. So thank you very much, dear Avishek, for inviting me to join you on this joyous occasion. First, allow me to offer you my warm congratulations on the publication of your book. I know, as we probably all do, publishing a book is an arduous journey, and to celebrate this publication with friends and colleagues is an excellent way to mark the end of this journey. Before I turn to your book and say a few words in response, I would like to begin with stating that this book brings together fields and methods of inquiry that are very dear to me, namely philosophically inflected literary and cultural studies, post-colonial studies, aspects of post-humanism and new materialism, and of course, the study of memory. 
And it is in this context that I had the pleasure to make the acquaintance of you, dear Avishek, as well as Dr. Marin Simi Rajas. What started out as a tentative exploration of connective threads between the Frankfurt Memory Studies platform, which I have the pleasure and honor to co-direct with the marvelous Astrid Erdi and the newly founded Center for Memory Studies at IIT Madras. And that has developed into a fruitful academic partnership and new friendships. Avishek and Marin are editing the Handbook on Memory Studies in India in the book series that I have the pleasure to co-edit with Rebecca Vince. And we are very excited and delighted to see how this seminal contribution will take shape. What is more, Avishek and Marin co-founded the Indian Network as a national network within the framework of the Memory Studies Association. We as the Memory, Memory Studies Association are very glad to have such a vibrant community of scholars as part of the association. And it is also largely due to Avishek's and Marin's magical drive that the memory studies as a field continues to grow. Again, it is a pleasure to have been invited to today's book launch. And I'm very much looking forward to more adventures, collaborations, exchanges, and of course, several book launches in the future. Now to the matter at hand. And matter, as you already know, is a key term today. In his book, Dr. Avishek Perui explores the very nature of what literary scholar Anne Rigney calls durability of literary texts. In the words of Avishek, the author, this monograph contributes to shedding light on the questions of, and I quote, how a literary text becomes a voice and a vehicle of its contemporary culture, while also speaking selectively and stylistically to its subsequent ages, which consume it for its literary merit, as well as moral message. In other words, what makes literature literary, canonical, meaningful, and durable? And what makes specific texts have afterlives, another term from Anne Rigney, while, uh, whilst others sink into oblivion? Of course, these are fundamental questions to the field of literary and cultural studies, and they have kept generations of scholars busy, as I would argue. Parui, however, finds an innovative approach as he fruitfully connects the questions of literary, aesthetic, and cultural balance to questions of new materialism and post-humanist approaches to the study of culture. Parui argues that the act of creating value is a narrative act based in narratives and is consolidated and consumed through literary texts. In this regard, this monograph establishes a close connection between the study of society and culture in general with the study of literature in particular, as they are both deeply entangled. The normative grid or framework that structures collectives and whose formation is of course a cultural act in itself, as Parori reminds us, can be reinterpreted and recontextualized through a combination of matter, metaphor, and memory. Between these three coordinates, matter, metaphor, and memory, normative meaning and cultural balance is created. What I would add to this triad, of course, uh, but of course that destroys this nice alliteration, is narrative. Perui makes the convincing point that one of the most prominent cultural modes is narrative. And the same can be argued about memory and the processes of remembering. And to explore these dynamic entanglements further, Perui embarks on an ambitious project I fully share uh, Catherine's view here, and brings together a most diverse array of approaches and schools of thoughts. Thing theory, material engagement theory, memory studies, race studies, and affect studies. He draws on work of important voices as diverse as Paul Ricoeur, Edward Said, Jerome Bruner, Wolfgang Isa, Sarah Ahmed, and Arjun Apadurai, just to name a few. The outcome is an intellectually challenging exercise of exploring, and again, in the words of the author, quote, complex correspondences, collusions, and critical tensions between culture and the literary. Literature in this vein becomes a space of co-constructed possibilities. And when matter is transformed into literary text, aesthetic agency, again, and Rigney, emerges and can be studied. And this is at the end of the day, what makes Perui's book a unique and important contribution to the field of literary memory studies. Perui refocuses our attention on how matter enters fiction 
and what that means for ontological and epistemological constellations. I would like to end my response with a quote from Avishek's monograph that captures the essence of this intellectually rigorous monograph. And I quote, if culture is a complex combination of matter and memory, literature is especially suited to reflect and represent the same with its fictional and sometimes metaphorical negotiation with events and eventualities. I congratulate you once again, dear Abhishek, on this wonderful and thought-provoking monograph, and here's to many more to come. Thank you. I'm deeply touched and overwhelmed by such fantastic introductions and addresses. Honestly, I think it's better than my book. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine, uh, Hannah, and of course, uh, Professor Tripathi, who's been such a pillar of support at a departmental level, as well as academically, someone I look up to. Uh, academically as well as uh, in terms of collegial support. So the funny thing about memory studies is we there are two funny things that I can think of at the moment. And that is, first of all, that memory studies are sometimes more obsessed with forgetting rather than remembering. So we deal with forgetting more often. We look at why something gets forgotten, why uh, do certain events and situations get forgotten, et cetera. So we, and if you remember, Catherine just mentioned two of her talks and I, noticed with some embarrassment that forgetting features on title of both the talks. So I think it's no coincidence that we end up actually talking more about forgetting and memory studies than we do about remembering, which is obviously a complex thing to do. The other funny thing about memory studies is we sometimes end up looking at memory not so much as a retrospective activity, but as something which is sort of future making. You know? So memory is a futuristic activity, memory which not just allows us to look back but also gives us the tools, as it were, uh, to shape the future. So in terms of what you remember and how you remember, uh, sort of situates the present in a way which shapes towards the future. So these are the two sort of paradoxical constructs that we often deal with in memory studies. A, that we deal more with forgetting, and second, remembering has sometimes more often to do with you know, looking forward, you know, politically, collectively, as well as existentially. Uh, now, this obviously connects to <clears throat> the very complex phenomenon of encoding, which is something that I've touched upon uh, very briefly in this book, and I do hope to expand on this idea as well. I had this fascinating conversation with Professor Kamakoti, the director, uh, who, who is one of the towering figures in AI uh, innovation and research in our country and also internationally. And we had a really interesting and stimulating conversation about looking at encoding as something which happens in machines, technologies, instruments, et cetera, but also equally something which happens culturally, collectively, right? So if you look at culture as an act of encoding, so how do cultures get transmitted? So the idea of transmission of cultures takes place actually through encoding. And obviously every act of encoding is also simultaneously an act of de-encoding. So we remember and forget, things get unremembered as things progress, as cultures progress. And Hannah was mentioned narratives. So I think narratives is a fantastic example of you know, the whole idea of chunking in certain things. And chunking is a term used in cognitive narratology as well as psychology. Coincidentally, this metaphor is used by neuroscientists as well as narratologists. What gets chunked in, what gets chunked out. So every act of chunking in is also an act of chunking out. And this obviously connects organically uh, to fiction which is the domain that I come from. So I'm a scholar, I'm a, I'm a student of literature and fiction. Uh, that is my, my, my standing in this whole business as it were. That is the only platform through which I can look with some degree of confidence uh, in memory studies, the whole idea of fiction as, as, as a platform. So, you know, we end up looking at fiction as an effective as well as an effective medium, which can combine possibilities. And Hannah was very kind to quote, a section from my book that I'm actually quite, uh, I was quite confident in writing that section. So I'm glad that Hannah picked up on that, which means it perhaps struck a chord somewhere at the reader. And that is looking at fiction as a production of possibilities. In other words, uh, you know, fiction as a combination of what may have historically happened with something which could have happened and something which should have happened. So all these different focal points get combined get mixed up, which is what makes fiction uh, subversive, which is why novels get banned more often than history books, despite their fictional status, but which also 
connect something which I picked up from a recent conversation with Astrid, uh, which is very kindly organized by uh, you know, Catherine's group uh, in St. Andrews, as part of a collaboration which we had. And Astrid, in a typically brilliant lecture, talked about the, the subliminal quality of literature. So I think it's not just enough to say literature is a liminal category, which sort of intertwines fiction, uh, you know, fantasy, imagination, reality, but it's also a subliminal quality about literature, you know, in terms of how it can accommodate the subconscious, right? And I think that makes literature, and this is something I learned from Astrid in that talk, uh, not just an act of representation, as in representing the past, remembering the past, et cetera, but also an act of anticipation. Right? It also trains us to anticipate the future. Literature as a tool also trains us to anticipate what's going on and anticipate what might happen in the times to come. So this might quality of literature is interesting as well, as well as articulating what we normally define as ambivalence, uh, the ability to have double valences, ambivalence, right? So, rather than looking at reality representation as dualistic categories, literature has this very unique liminal as well as a subliminal scope uh, in looking at these as connected categories, so absence and presence uh, connected together. So this book has been a very modest effort, which is also reflective of my research interests you know, in encoding, storytelling. And Hannah was bang on when she talked about the missing fourth term, narrative, it should be there, it should have been there, it's screaming out from the book, but it's not there in the title because I just went for the cheeky alliteration. So, uh, but it is all about narratives, right? It's entirely about how narratives are coded culturally, collectively, politically, institutionally, architecturally, but as well as in a good old book form, in a textual form. So how, how do cultures get encoded into novels and stories, uh, which are intergenerational, which are defined as classics, uh, the survivability of literature. So how do, you know, people sort of keep going back to Shakespeare and Dickens and the whole politics of canon construction, et cetera. Struti was mentioning towards the beginning, uh, one of the trust areas in our center is looking at the, the entanglement of AI technology in the human mind uh, in terms of how machines can be encoded information which can be trained to do certain acts. Uh, and as Professor Kamakoti was mentioning, and this is the conversation I had with him yesterday, but it isn't enough to sort of leave it at that Right, And I argue in my book and also elsewhere that what makes a human mind unique is the ability to be ambivalent, uh, is the ability to hesitate uh, and sort of have this multiple balances running in the head. Right, so That is a more complex cognitive act rather than just feeding data and making a machine run to a certain direction. So I think that's something that's a really interesting overlap which uh, Warren's research, which requires research, and this book has been a very tiny step, but hopefully a sincere step in that direction. And lastly, I must end with the memory of writing this book. Uh, the two abiding, the two most significant memories that I have of the book is a moment in which this book was conceived, but literally when I got the email which told me the contract is finalized, materialized, etc., that happened in a very, very crowded airport. The Delhi airport, the most crowded place in the world, as you can imagine, where you can we have to wrestle to just get one little space. And that was where the email came in, the very, very crowded chronotop of the airport. That's where the book got conceived. And interestingly, the point in which the book got concluded was an empty building because that was a high point of COVID where there was literally no one around me. It was an empty building. We had a strange sense of vacancy. And that obviously people who have people like us, and I'm sure most of the colleagues can relate to this, who have ventured in the public space during that moment, a very different experience of space and time in terms of a slowed down sense of space and time, in terms of a more spatial understanding of time and a more temporal understanding of space as well, uh, because that is actually a very complex chronotop. And it's something that we have researched and also published in a wonderful volume that Hannah has edited along with Jeff Hollick. So, these two have been the most abiding memories that I carry with this book, the crowded airport in which it, the contract came in and the abundant and sort of vacant and scary space in which the book, book got written and the final email sent from that building. So I think that I'm going to carry that uh, as long as I can remember this book. So uh, a lot of notes of gratitude are in order. I'm very grateful, obviously, to the wonderful institutional support that we're very lucky to have in this uh, magnificent institute at Madras. And I think we just got up to test one into that with a very warm and wonderful address 
that Professor Kamakoda delivered. And it's constant collaboration, it's constant dialogue we have across disciplines, across departments, which makes it such a vibrant space. Uh, I'm very grateful to our department, especially our HD, Professor Tripathi, who has been, as I mentioned, a really a strong pillar of support since the very inception of the center. Uh, very grateful to our colleagues and collaborators, two of whom are present right here, who just delivered phenomenal addresses, with Catherine and Hannah. Uh, very grateful to the wonderful work we're doing at St. Andrews, and I hope this is the beginning of a long and beautiful collaboration in the times to come. Uh, to, with Frankfurt members of this platform, as well as at MSA, that Hannah is such a powerful presence in. And of course, with our very own Center for Memory Studies, my colleague and collaborator, Dr. Meryn Simiraj, uh, who was very helpful in terms of the index of this book. So I uh, owe a lot to her, as well as to our wonderful officers, Ashraya Maria and Shruti Dunayan, uh, who's hosting this program, but also to all my scholars, all my MS students, all my PhD students, from whom I never cease to learn. I learn a lot from interacting with all of you in very unique ways, in classrooms, in interactions, in all kinds of discourses that we share. Lastly, and personally, I owe a lot to my parents. I couldn't attend this because they don't know what Zoom is. Uh, Zoom is just a magnifying verb to them, which was what I thought as well before the pandemic. But of course, the pandemic changed the ontology of Zoom as it were. Uh, my sister, who is based in the UK, has been a wonderful pillar of support uh, in almost everything I do. Uh, my wonderful in-laws, uh, PK Saha, Sopna Saha, Samudra Saha, who is actually joining this event despite his very busy professional schedule. And lastly, the two people who are the most significant presence in my life, not just in this book, but also everything that I attempt to do. My wife, Priyanka, who is the leader of our pack, the captain of our team, who is attending this, and a very beautiful and gifted son, Oynish, who's four years old, but who's precociously talented, who's already had a goal in trying to read this book. Uh, but I've sort of stalled that. But I do hope he reads it at some point in the distant future and approves of his old man's work. Thank you very much for attending this. Good evening, everyone. It's such an honor and delight to be part of the launch of this book, Culture and the Literary Matter, Matter for Memory. This book reflects the theoretical and pragmatic uh, aspects of the work that we do here at the Center for Memory Studies at IIT Madras. The work has, uh, the book uh, uh, not quite reflects it. It has a very strong technology component alongside the cultural, philosophical, and neurological dimensions of memory. And we've heard much about it in the first half of this event as well. I join you all in conveying my most sincere appreciation towards everything that went into the making of this book. I wish this book every success and I'm most certain that it has already opened up as we uh, saw uh, many modes of innovative modes of critical inquiry in the exciting and very promising field of memory studies. So this is the second book, uh, book launch from our center. The first one being an edited volume on Anglo-Indian identity brought out by Paul Graham Maxwell in London in 2021. Two of our contributors and collaborators in the Anglo Indian project, uh, Professor Uther and Professor Brent, are also present over here. Uh, we also have the third book in the pipeline. We, uh, we are contracted to edit the Brill Handbook on Memory Studies in India, which Dr. Hannah Teichler very kindly mentioned. I'm really excitedly looking forward to it, too. In terms of the work that we do at the center, I also take this opportunity to briefly uh, tell about that. Uh, we've already established an XR lab, and we've been working on the theoretical and uh, uh, philosophical connections between memory and artificial intelligence and memory and digital humanities, particularly the tools of AR and VR, which we are experimenting with and we are hopefully will be able to deliver a few output which researchers in humanities and from different disciplines will be able to access uh, possibly by the middle of this year. Uh, we are in the process of creating a digital archive in that regard, also a virtual heritage museum of the IIT campus primarily. We are beginning with that site through immersive and interactive tools. And uh, all of these things hopefully will be accessible to the public by the middle of this year. And we're very, very excited about uh, exploring these many interfaces, which offer a lot of uh, uh, futuristic possibilities in humanities research. There are a lot of people and a lot of institutional support has come into the making of uh, the work that we do over here. We are very grateful to Professor Kamakoti, Director IIT Madras, for taking time off this, his busy schedule and for sharing a very motivating address. Uh, the director's office here at IIT Madras has always been extremely supporting and encouraging in all our research endeavors and have been part of uh, all the events that we hosted from the center from the time of its inception. 
uh, Professor Jyotirmay Tripathi, the head of uh, humanities and social sciences, uh, has always offered us uh, um, uh, unwavering support uh, from the time of the inception of our research network. And uh, uh, he is a brilliant academic on his own right. And uh, under his wonderful uh, leadership, uh, we have been able to flourish uh, as a center. And we're very grateful to him for the institutional and the infrastructural support that we get on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, on behalf of the center, I thank Professor Catherine O'Leary, uh, Director of Cultural Identity and Memory Studies Institute at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, the collaboration with St. Andrews, which has culminated in an MOU and the British Council Going Global Partnerships Grant, you know, they are among the many other events and upcoming projects, which uh, uh, Professor O'Leary very kindly mentioned as well. Thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Hannah Teichler is connected to us through uh, two very rich institutional associations, the MSA, Memory Studies Association, and Frankfurt Memory Studies Platform. She's also the series editor of uh, the Brill Handbook series, which she very, very kindly mentioned. And as mentioned, we are very excited about that, the next big project that we have from the center. We have been receiving, we've been very fortunate to receive tremendous institutional support from IIT Madras. We take this opportunity to particularly thank uh, uh, Professor Aguraman Rangaswamy, the Dean of Global Engagement, and Professor Ravind Rugetu, the Dean of ICNSA, which is the Industrial Consultancy and Sponsored Research Center. Uh, we thank them for their generous support in the day-to-day -day running and practically you know, everything that uh, we uh, require administratively, technically uh, for the center. Uh, we are also grateful for our students and colleagues, the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, and this space, this department and the, the center space, these are the sites where our teaching, research, and administrative experiences uh, find perfect synergy. We're very grateful for this uh, space. On behalf of the center, uh, again, let me thank each one of you for making this event very successful and very meaningful. And we are very grateful that many of our participants from the earlier workshops and who've been collaborating with us in various events are also over here. It's a delightful experience to join with you all at this uh, event. We also have here with us researchers and colleagues from different academic establishments whose participation has always been invaluable. We thank our colleagues at the International Memory Studies Association for the generous support from the inception of our research network, even before we became a center. And now uh, we could, uh, you know, with their uh, support, diversify in so many ways institutionally, academically, and also branch out to different interdisciplinary research possibilities. Uh, thanks are also due to the Frankfurt Memory Studies platform and uh, Professor Astrid who's been the mentor figure for the center. Uh, finally, we must thank Dr. Shruti Vinayan, our project manager, and Ashriya Maria, the research associate, without whom this event and our everyday running of the center would not have been possible at all. So thank you, Shruti and Ashriya. We are uh, very excited about this research journey ahead, and we are now and later on also very delighted to collaborate with you in various capacities and share with you this uh, different milestones of this journey. This book, uh, we must say, has given us the momentum and the right kind of push towards the uh, theoretical and pragmatic approaches that would help us and many more researchers to frame the multiple interfaces between memory, culture, and technology. Thank you all for being here. Have a great evening ahead. Thank you very much.